Moana as a movie is filled with ideologically possessed symbolism. This analysis will try to give the mythological story a fair shake, although I will mention some of the more egregious examples. What I define as the difference between the ideological elements and the mythological elements of the story involves the intellectual intent of the artists. When an artist puts an element into their production for the purposes of making a statement, that is by definition propaganda. These types of injections into narrative stories are commonplace in modern media, from I am no man in Lord of the Rings to the mentally deficient rooster psychic in Moana, the overt ideological elements are easy to spot and not worth much focus. Instead, I am going to focus on the ideology showing its true nature within the framework of the mythological symbolism. So without further ado, let's begin our analysis of Moana. opens in the typical way for a mythological tale with the first five minutes basically giving you the entire overview you need. It explains that Moana's cosmogony begins with only ocean, which is an old mythological representation of potential and is decidedly feminine in this reading. The ocean gives birth to Tefiti, and she is the giver of all life, and she creates all of the islands. Right? And many crave Tefiti's heart, it said, and they want to control it for themselves. So they want to control the life-giving elements of the goddess, Tefiti, right? And one, namely Maui, who's, you know, very clever and is called trickster, shapeshifter, right? He actually does. And it's important to know how he does this. He, you know, shapeshifts his way into the island, and then he uses a, his magic fish hook to pry the heart of Tefiti out of her. And once he does that, the whole island turns black and death and kind of destruction start to spread, right? As he escapes, and then he runs into this monster who's claimed in the beginning uh, to also want after the heart, named Taka. And she's this like fire and demon earth monster, right? And she battles uh, Maui and, and he tries to fight her with his fish hook and they end up having this epic brawl, and then the heart and his fish hook fall to the bottom of the ocean, and that's the last you see of Maui in the intro. And that kind of sets up the introduction to Moana. Now, I want to talk and break this down a little bit here. A couple things to note. Again, I mentioned that the ocean represents potential. It represents chaos. It represents something that's new, right? New forms. And, and to some extent, so does Tefiti as the giver of life, right? She comes from the ocean. That's why she comes out of the ocean. She's the first to emerge. As far as Maui goes, he's a god of the sky, right? He's shown initially flying around like a hawk. So he represents the sky. And the sky is decidedly masculine in this telling. So he's the masculine of, of, of the pattern, and she's the feminine. And in their interaction, the masculine element, right, the father of civilization, you come to find out later that, that Maui gave humans fire. He gave them the islands. He pulled the islands from the sea, according to the song, right? Which is interesting because Tefiti takes credit for that as well, spreading life to the islands. Um, but Maui takes credit for it too. He uses his fish hook, and, and his fish hook is a is basically just a representation of technology. That's what it is. It even lights up like technology, right? In the movie, it's magic. It and it allows him to do things and take multiple forms and accomplish things that he couldn't normally accomplish, right? He uses his fish hook to actually remove the fertility from the goddess. That's an important point. And in doing that, he unleashes, we find out later, Taka. Taka ends up being the barren form of the goddess Tefiti. All right, so let's break down the prologue, you know, kind of the background of the movie, into one basic statement. I think it can go something like this. The father of civilization harnessed technology to attempt to control the life-giving element of the feminine, and in so doing, unleashed a raging feminine monster that spreads death. This statement, while it's really kind of only half the story, right? As 
the father's technology also supports life-giving elements of our species, such as, you know, lowering infant mortality and increasing fertility among those who are actually infertile, right? Um, but that side of it, the, the side of it of, of stripping the life-giving element out, out and subverting it to its control is really piercing for today's age. I, and I, I just... I can't believe that an ideologically, like a movie that's so ideologically, what I would say, aligned with the left of center political groups would allow something that had such um, an underlying warning message about hormonal contraceptive, right? And the, the decreasing fertility of the human species to get out. and. So what I, what I have to conclude from that is that the collective unconscious that even the most ideologically possessed among us is crying out for this problem to be solved. It, it has identified this problem and it's, it's manifesting it in art, even though the, the higher layers of intellect for those people would be ideologically opposed to even identifying that as a problem. And I find that super fascinating. So let's get back to uh moana as a character so the next development of the story is to establish moana as a character and so she's shown to be you know the daughter of the chief of her people and next in line for the position um and so in one of the opening scenes her father like walks her up to the highest point of her society which is she he says is a sacred place right and um shows her a stack of rocks and he explains that each chief before her has like added his stone to the stack and one day that she'll add hers so the, what's cool about this is that the metaphoric elements of this stacking of rocks are really great they're almost perfect right each ruler before is raising the island closer to heaven closer to the sky right and uh, building off of the work that, of those that came before. It's, it's really a good tale about what you would expect from a healthy, evolving, functioning society, right? And Moana, to her credit, receives this well. Um, you know, her father stresses to her that her people need her and that she needs to stay, ha stay in, in, on the island and, and has a duty to them to, to, you know, make sure she leads them correctly. Um, and she seems to take this responsibility seriously, but uh during the intro it shows her being distracted by her grandmother and the ocean off to the side and so that kind of brings us back to the ocean right which we talked about in the beginning it represents potential and and, and the possibility of new forms and her grandma you know plays with the ocean as though it's like this mischievous thing right that she can just interact with at will and i think that's kind of an important point is that um you know, Moana is drawn to the possibilities of new forms is what it shows. So I, I kind of want to step out here and say that, uh, that the father, even though he talked about um, the, the, the civilization being raised higher and higher, he did make it clear in one of the earlier songs that, that his civilization has lost its connection with... Um, the creative elements of the unknown and basically he says that he, he's he's scared of the coming destruction but he he instructs moana that she cannot leave the safety of the island or known space right she has to keep her head down and stay on what is known because outside of the reefs outside of the islands known space there's danger and so in in some respects it's it's really a cool telling of the osiris set horus mythology right in which you know, Osiris is blind to Set's plotting and evil and ends up being overtaken by him and descends down into the underworld only for Horus to, to have to descend in the underworld and give his, you know, give his father an eye, the eye of Horus, in order for his father to be able to see again, right? And it revivifies him. And, you know, in this telling, Moana is kind of, you know, this that doesn't really play very far in this, but it's definitely the, down in the substructure of it. Moana playing the role of Horus here. So the mythological substructure of this entire movie has been inverted, right? All the traditional masculine elements of the story arc are replaced or supplanted by the feminine heroine. And I mentioned that just, just to, to let you know that I see it 
I don't really want to focus on it, but I do want to show one example to think it's relevant. And that's what I'm showing on the screen right now. It's in the final scene, right? And the final scene displays this in, in its most striking, dramatic fashion. Moana, at the end, you know, we had talked about the stack um, of stones that her father had talked about raising society higher and higher. Moana, instead of placing a stone up there at the very end of the movie, once she has finished her journey, you know, reinstilled fertility in the life-giving element into the goddess and her people are safe, right? She puts a conch shell, right? And that's that, like, it's not even a conch shell. It, it's a symbolic vagina. And she paces it right on top of the traditional hierarchy of the past. And that hierarchy had indicated the elevation of the society towards heaven through successive generations. And, and basically what she's doing by doing that, she has now ceased the ascension of her people symbolically with a new reign of, I guess, the benevolent, benevolent feminine. Right? Nothing can be stacked on top of a conch shell. She can't raise it any higher, right? No further advancement is possible. So the statement that be, we're being given here is that the ultimate society is one in which the feminine is elevated above the masculine and traditional hierarchy is supplanted by an unanchored and non-stable society constantly afloat in a sea of chaos with no structure to live on. You know, because right after she places the conch shell, her people leave the island forever and go explore the ocean again. They're out in unknown space all the time with no foot in the known. It's imbalanced in that regard, right? Like you don't want to be completely in unknown space ever. You want to have one foot in known space, one foot in unknown space, right? So that you have balance between the two. Some of this should be sounding relevant to today's political climate. Like all traditional structures and known space are constantly being questioned and revised in a rapid and chaotic way that kind of leaves us feeling unanchored to e even norms of 10 years ago, right? The reason I chose to talk about this movie specifically, in spite of all of the ideological injections that, you know, I kind of mentioned some of them, is that the screenwriters still happen to lay out a compelling mythological substructure that poses the question of how to revitalize our barren society and then answers that question quite accurately in my mind with females embracing and reinstalling the life-giving elements into the feminine goddess. Typically, right, I would lambast that gender role inversion. As we all know, it's the masculine that places the seed inside the feminine and brings forth life as was originally stated as Maui's um, destiny. Right, his what he had, what the grandmother said he had to do. Right, in the modern world, however, the feminine is barren, not because of a lack of seed planting by the masculine. <laughs> Quite to the contrary, uh, plenty of seed is planted over and over in barren ground nowadays, but rather from the the, the infertility is from a self-imposed chemical sterilization. Therefore, the restoration of fertility within the feminine component of our species kind of has to be done by a willing female hero, right? The only other alternative is to be imposed by a tyrannical masculine element. And I don't really want to live in that world, right? It needs to be, you know, uh, I don't like that, right? The latter story is not one that, that I think anyone wants. So that being said, I, I, I do want to mention the stories really poor handling of the character of Maui. So upon Maui's official entrance into the movie, he sings a beautiful song titled, You're Welcome. I happen to really like this song. I think Dwayne Johnson did a great job singing it. And I, I find the lyrics to be um, quite, they're just, they're just well done. It's quite poetic. Um, but basically the song lays out how wonderful Maui has been to humanity. From giving them coconut trees, to pulling the islands from the sea, to giving them wind behind their sails. Like every single aspect of what's good about human civilization, Maui is responsible for. And he's take cre taking credit for um, all of the advancement of civilization before. The writers deliver this information in the form of a vain Maui, though, singing about his own accomplishments to a rather bamboozled but unthankful Moana. The movie shows 
our protagonist in Moana being swept up in Maui's illusion about how great his works are, right? Only to be brought back to reality in holding worthless rocks instead of the bountiful goods Maui claimed he gave, that he gave humanity. What's really striking about that right there is that Maui is correct. You know, Maui representing the fathers of civilization, right? The eternal fathers of civilization have provided us this wonderful society overall that keeps disease at bay, predation has extended life. We, we pretty much eliminated hunger. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but all of those things compared to what we were, where we were at, you know, 6,000, 7,000 years ago are, are way, way better. And Moana's, when the writer showed at the very end that she, you know, he's throwing out her, all these fruits to her, right? All these bountiful goods that he's produced from his works. And she's loving it in the song. She's looking at him like, oh, these are great. At the very end of the song, the illusion snaps and she's shown to be holding like rocks. And that statement that, that everything that our forefathers gave us is nothing but a bunch of crap is another form of the ideological injection. It's not balanced. It's not rational. And it's, it's ungrateful in general. And it's, 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 it, it takes a beautiful song. Like the, the correct response from Moana should be like, yeah, no doubt all of that stuff that you did is great. And we wouldn't be here without that. However, I need you to help me put this fertility thing back in this demon, right? Like you can, you can, you can tread lightly. And I think probably the best way to explain it is, is to go back to a biblical story. And I think the writers kind of forgot this, but it involves Noah and the flood. So um, I'm going to read from, from the Bible here. So the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These were the three sons of Noah that came from them and came from them, the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Noah, a man of soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside of his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backwards and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, cursed be to Canaan, the lowest of slaves, will he be to his brothers? And again, like, you know, one of the, probably the, the easiest interpretations from this the most applicable to this is one that Jordan Peterson gave in one of his lectures as well, is that, you know, you need to be really careful when you, when you criticize your father, right? Especially Noah, because, you know, Noah got them through the flood. And so this idea that, you know, he came, that, uh, that Ham is basically gonna, you know, disrespect Noah for making one mistake and that somehow invalidates all of Noah, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. And so, that's kind of what Moana is doing here. You know, she's, she's not being sufficiently respectful of, of Maui and, um, and all that came before her. And like I said, in Maui's song, really just all that lay, all that song and in his intro laid out, should have laid out the amount of debt that we owe to our forefathers, right? Like, it's just a really, it's really sad that they didn't see that, right? Um, that being said, the screenwriters did decide to display that the masculine as inept and weak and cowardly throughout the entire movie, you know, scenes of like Moana toppling the statue of Maui, you know, him being the father of civilization in this myth, right. As well as her mentally handicapped rooster sidekick, you know, uh, they're just kind of simplistic ideological jabs that don't really deserve much conversation about. And they detract from the overall story. They're, they're not, they don't even help at all, right? Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't do anything for the telling. So, some of that, like, there's a mythological story about the tyrannical father that's possible. And this is tenuously tied to that. But it doesn't do it justice at all, right? There's no tyrannical, potent masculine element in this story anywhere to be found. 
that Moana's up against. Her father's loving, right? If not a little misguided, but loving. And Maui's just kind of a nice guy who did one thing that kind of turned out bad, but did a lot of good things that turned out really good. So there's no rage against the machine going on, right? There's no there's no tyranny of the masculine that's that's in this movie anywhere to be found at all for her to be so rebellious against. And yet she's rebellious against the benevolent side of the masculine. It, it's, it's very interesting. She's very interesting. Overall, I think what I'd say now is that modern society has been in a constant state of embrace of the new and unknown to the point to where tradition, um, is, anything that's traditional at all is immediately viewed as oppressive. Um, and that, that shows here, and it's the result of the ideology that's behind a lot of these jabs. I think that without the inclusion in this story of that raging barren feminine and that lair that it adds, I think this movie would have failed to capture the audience's attention. Um, just because there, there's not much substance other than that here mythologically. Not, not that it's relevant to today, right? I, I worry that we that that the the stated outcome is actually manifesting itself in society right they, they did a good job of actually packaging the end result symbolically of what's going on in in uh, a ceasing ascension and a constantly adrift society with no stability being the outcome of this and i think that's absolutely correct um from the ideology's perspective so I think that'll probably wrap up my analysis of Moana. I'd like to ask you guys a couple questions if you made it this far into the video. Um, first, um, did I hit on all the elements that, that, that you guys wanted me to address? And if not, throw them in the comment section and I'll see if I can you know, round them out. And secondly, one of the things that, that I think is most important here is, is I have this idea that the level of truth in the mythological substructure, like of relevant truth in the mytholo mythological substructure of a story is correlated with its resonance and therefore um, profitability and reception in our in an audience, right? And so Moana was relatively successful as was Frozen, but I, I kind of want to unpack that idea a little more and I want to hear what you guys have to th say about that as a general idea. So as always, please like and subscribe. Um, I'm going to attempt to put on my website um, a list of episodes under production um, so you guys will kind of know the topics I'm working on. And if you guys have any topic suggestions, please send them to my email, coronius.focus at gmail.com. Uh, and thanks, guys.